So I'm Luke Nottage, uh, professor at the University of Sydney Law School, um, and I'm going to briefly outline uh, the way that legal practice in Australia, from my perspective, has really um, become much more globalised, uh, just like our economy and society. Um, especially starting one generation ago, if you cast your minds back 30 years um, and think about what's changed from the, especially the 1990s, I think uh, you know, first of all, we have a lot more law that's based on international law instruments, either hard law like treaties, such as, say, the UN Sales Convention, um, uh, but also soft law international instruments like model laws, like the UNCTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration, which became, um, you know, the core of first our International Arbitration Act for international arbitrations and more recently uh, the core of the Commercial Arbitration Act for domestic arbitrations. Um, but also starting in the 1990s I think you see a lot more diverse foreign borrowings um, as templates and inspirations for law reforms. So. Uh, in my fields, uh, other fields of, say, uh, consumer law, uh, we see EU-style strict product liability being introduced into what was then the Trade Practices Act. Uh, it's now been renamed, reconfigured as a nationwide Australian consumer law. Um, we also find unfair contract terms regulations, which um, originally were adopted in Victoria, in 2000, but then went nationwide in 2010, which are also based on the EU approach. Uh, but we also look to the US, for example, for opt-out class actions from the 1990s at the federal level and then spreading through the states more recently. Um, and another area of interest and in research of mine is in corporate governance. And if you, if you look at, think about the independent director's requirements, in which are a major feature for listed companies in Australia, um, you know, that's inspired by discussions primarily in the UK, the Cadbury report in the early 90s. It took us until 2004 to introduce that regime into our listing rules and our corporate governance principles. But um, we also see that sort of foreign borrowing and evolution. Um, and actually, in all these areas, I'd say that uh, we share a lot also with uh, there are a lot of parallels with what's going on in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, so in corporate governance, independent directors, I'm coming up with a book that looks at the spread of independent directors across the broader Asian region. So that's been a sort of a longer term trend of the last 30 years. And then in the last decade or so, as you know, as uh, practicing lawyers, I think um, there's been a further globalisation in the sense of the, the, the large international law firms arriving in Australia, either tying up or setting up branches here, um, which takes this sort of global engagement potential to the next level. I mean, that's partly driven by the post-global financial crisis, uh, you know, era we live in for legal practice, but also um, uh, it creates, uh, and it's also been assisted by free trade agreements and so on for uh, providing uh, more scope for mobility of lawyers and uh, cross-border legal service delivery. Um, however, I'd just like to add that there are some limits here. Um, uh, first of all, we find that there is still a lack of understanding of international in instruments. And we can see this clearly in the sort of case law that emerges, say, on the UN Sales Convention, even though that's been adopted into Australian law for several decades even in the International Arbitration Act. So uh, applying the model law that's been around since the 1990s, um, let alone some of the more diffuse foreign borrowings that we see, say, EU-style strict product liability. If you look at the case law there, we, we, we seem to struggle uh, to interpret them in a sort of international spirit based on the usual understandings of those underlying instruments. Um, Sometimes that's because 
lack the understanding. Sometimes it's because we don't want to understand them because you can see that it suits one side to make an argument that is out of sync with the way these underlying instruments overseas or internationally are originally interpreted and designed. Um, and then really it puts the onus back on the other side's lawyers to sort of say, look, that's not, that's not correct, that's not the way these things were designed uh, for it to be interpreted and so on. Um, but, you know, sometimes that's, that then depends on the, the capacity of the, um, of the other side's lawyers and their advisors, uh, the barristers even at the end of the day, rather than the solicitors. And um, once a, a precedence get, gets established in, in our court system, especially at an appellate level, it gets very difficult for a, a, a subsequent court, uh, obviously in that jurisdiction, but even in another jurisdiction within Australia to sort of depart from that. Um, you know, the High Court tells us that they should only do that if it's plainly wrong and that you have to be a sort of brave judge or a brave barrister or solicitor to say, look, we shouldn't follow that precedent from an intermediate court in another jurisdiction because it's plainly wrong. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't want to, you know, be too critical about the legal advisers and the courts here because often also the underlying law we adopt in Australia, we tend to um, fiddle with. We don't um, necessarily slot in, you know, the full version or the exact version that's been developed and used successfully overseas. We like to, like to think we can sort of tweak it or improve it, and sometimes that's that's useful. But other times it creates a lot of extra complexity and and unnecessary or um, unexpected uh, in potential for other different interpretations. Um, and perhaps that's got something to do with our broader legislative reform processes. I think uh, we tend now to see laws being made by line ministries um, or the Attorney General's Department leading law reform, referring things off, the government refers things off to the Productivity Commission, which has you know, a good policy basis from especially an economic point of view. Um, but the Law Reform Commissions, especially the Australian Law Reform Commission, is not getting um, good references, I think, from the government to engage in, you know, more sustained, uh, careful, um, comparative-based, uh, as well as policy-based law reform, at least in my areas of sort of business and consumer law. Um, and finally, uh, the, another limit is that. Um, uh, even, uh, even with free trade agreements and so on, I think uh, you know we're seeing quite a lot of backlash. Um, people get uh, are, are worried that this, so, well, some people are worried that globalisation is, is you know, impinging on their everyday lives, and they want to somehow reassert control, and so they they target certain things. Um, and free trade agreements and certain provisions within, within them, like the investor state dispute settlement provision procedure, extra option provided to foreign investors to enforce, enforce substantive commitments not to discriminate or expropriate foreign investments without uh, adequate compensation are sort of seized on uh, to try to sort of, I think, regain control in, of a sense of control of one's everyday life in this world that's sort of globalising, becoming more complex, and uh, for many people, therefore, therefore, becomes a little bit uncertain and, and disconcerting. So, uh, and I think that underlies, you know, the developments we've seen in the UK with Brexit, the Brexit vote, trying to leave the or wanting to leave the EU. Um, or indeed the election of President Trump in the US. You know, it's just, um, there's a sort of nostalgia for, you know, uh, some era in the past which was somehow simpler, although, of course, globalisation and, and the impact of world events has been with us <laughs> forever, uh, but certainly for many, many generations. But there is this perception that, uh, you know, it's gone too far or to a new level or the impact is too disparate, uh, unfair somehow, and so we're seeing this backlash. And so 
you know, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, FTA, are now seem to be dead in the water under this new US administration, um, which, mean, and which means that the other 11 economies, including Australia, um, you know, won't see it ratified under the current presidency unless Trump backtracks. Um, and, you know, uh, it, this will have an impact on all sorts of other free trade agreements um, that are under negotiation as well. Can, can I just go back to basics and get you to um, explain to us uh, what is meant by globalisation today? Well, um, I suppose from my perspective, looking at it from comparative transnational business and consumer law, and we're talking about um, that process of um, uh, adjusting our legal practice, our legal system, so that it um, addresses, you know, the sorts of issues that arise when uh, goods, services, people, you know, cross borders and uh, and the sort of all the, the legal implications of that, whether it's transaction planning or dispute resolution. And so, um, and as part of that, as the legal system reacts to sort of generate law reform or adapt pre-existing law to that sort of environment. Um, looking also then at um, international law instruments that can be adopted to address those particular growing issues uh, or just foreign models as ways in which other countries have uh, unilaterally or as part of a regional grouping like the EU address those sorts of issues. And are legislators destined to be playing catch up in that environment? Yes, yes, and it, and that's why I think the sort of process of law reform is very important because you uh, need to look carefully at what's going on overseas these days, um, and not just the black letter law, but then how it's implemented in practice and how it's actually functioning and then try to translate that into the Australian environment. And, um, and I think your view is that the Law Reform Commission is not being utilised as it should be in order to look at these issues that, that, are, that we're facing on a fairly regular basis. That's right. And uh, I must say, you know, we're going through a process of reform now of the Australian just, just Consumer Law. The, the Constra Australian Consumer Law is up for its first five yearly review. Um, and that's being coordinated through Treasury and the Consumer Affairs Ministers and Officials of the states and territories and New Zealand. Uh, and they are, you know, doing a, a, a good job at trying to find out what's going on overseas to see, you know, what, uh, see if we can further improve the regime and so on. Um, but it's... Uh, it's inevitably going to be quite sporadic and uh, also perhaps less comprehensive than if you, you know, had a sort of reference out to a, a law reform commission. So, for example, getting back to a uh, globalisation element, um, there are lots of issues in the Australian consumer law about applicable law um, to the different parts of the... Uh, Australian consumer law regime, which, as people know, um, not do, doesn't just apply to individuals purchasing for a pers for personal use or whatever. It extends to many types of business-to-business -business transactions, starting with sort of the misleading conduct prohibitions and unconscionable conduct prohibitions. As of this month, the unfair contract terms provisions are extended to small business, um, uh, with a particular definition of small business. So going beyond the EU approach, which focuses just on individuals purchasing for a non-business purpose, for example. Um, so it's a potentially very wide-ranging piece of legislation. And uh, one of the old parts of the, uh, of the Act uh, has a particular choice of law provision, which has actually recently been the subject of a, of a, of a judgment in the federal court um, I think quite a ambitious judgment, actually, 
uh, that didn't go back and look at the original legislative intent of that original provision, but anyway, it's there. But other parts of the Act don't have choice of law provisions. So what is a court to do when um, you know it has a cross-border element, especially not just in a real a B to C business to consumer transaction, but in a in one of these commercial transactions, like an unfair contract term dispute between a small business of less than 20 people, but up to millions of dollars potentially, with a foreign supplier, for example. There's no guidance as to you know, whether and how the ACL might apply if the parties have chosen, say, a foreign law to govern that dispute, as many current B2B contracts uh, probably do. And, and what is an arbitrator to do sitting here in Sydney? Um, you know, if the parties have expressly chosen a foreign law and said we want to exclude the application of the ACL because we know what we're doing, we're business, you know, business people. Uh, we want to choose a, a law that, from from overseas, uh, maybe the one of the foreign supplier or a third country's law. There's no guidance in the ACL now. I've raised this in submissions with Treasury. I raised it back in 2009 when we when we had the process of law reform driven actually then by the Productivity Commission primarily to enact a nationwide harmonised regime for this consumer law, including many business to business transactions. But they, they either didn't get it or they didn't want to do it and they said, well, that's not really, it's private international law, you should talk to the Attorney General's department. And, and they're doing a project on reforming arbitration law. So I went to talk to the arbitration. <laughs> law people in the Attorney General's Department say you've got to deal with the ACL issues. And they said, no, go back to Treasury. <laughs> it's complicated. We're just trying to fix the International Arbitration Act. Mm -hmm. let me, so, let me, let me you know, I this. think if it was yeah. in front of a law, a law reform commission, they would yeah. say, well, let's address these issues. Let's have a chapter in our report and decide what we're going to do about all these issues of choice of law and forum in the Australian consumer law. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. Let, let me just change the subject slightly, international arbitration. Um, what impact is that having on the way in which um, uh, legal services and the legal profession in New South Wales and Australia um, are operating? Do, do you see that in international arbitration is, is having a much bigger role in dispute resolution um, on the world stage? A world stage, certainly, you know, and this affects Australian companies. So they're uh, m much more familiar with international arbitration clauses and so on and uh, we're finding they agree to arbitration especially overseas or are able to negotiate to get arbitration with the seat overseas you know we find many cases um, uh, in the statistics say of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre with involving Australian parties um, and so on um, uh, Australian companies also um, engaging with the system when those for arbitration agreements for foreign seated arbitration that Australian companies have agreed to um, are subsequently contested and uh, typically the Australian party tries to get a stay uh, tries to get the matter heard in Australian courts but then the foreign party says no you've agreed on foreign arbitration so there should be a stay of proceedings um, and we also see uh, quite a few cases where the foreign arbitral award is is given and um, then sought to be enforced in Australia, mostly involving an Australian party, but sometimes just involving assets held by a uh, by a foreign party uh, with no Australian party involved. It's just that Australia is a convenient jurisdiction to get enforcement of the foreign arbitral award. Now, what we haven't se seen is a dramatic increase in the number of Australia seated international arbitrations. And uh, despite the best efforts of Michelle, who's going to join us later and so on, I think um, we have a number of impediments. One is the fact that we do have multiple jurisdictions, court jurisdictions, trying to in interpret this uh, International Arbitration Act regime. So um, nowadays the federal court leads the charge in trying to you know, interpret that in an international spirit and it seems to have slowly be having an effect on the other state courts um, to sort of make them lift their game and interpret it in a similar way. But it, inevitably we're going to have disparity just because of the nature of our system. Um, we also have a problem with legislative reform, 
It took us 21 years from 1989 to have the 2010 amendments. There was an error in the drafting process for the International Arbitration Act compared to the Commercial Arbitration Act that created a, what myself and Professor Richard Garnett um, at Melbourne Law School called a legislative black hole. It took five years for that to be fixed last year. Um, and, you know, there, in the meantime, there's a lot of change that's going on. Other countries are peer often updating their international arbitration acts, especially the major regional venues such as Singapore and Hong Kong. But just, just on that, yeah. um, Singapore has set up an international court. Mm. What impact did, do you think that has on Australia's legal system or legal profession to provide similar services? Are you asking whether we is should good, be Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing for Australia, to, for Singapore to have an international court? I think it's, you know, another a comparative disadvantage in Australia if we haven't got something similar. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to play catch up with them in the international arbitration space. Um, we've managed to attract a few more international arbitrations, act, uh, arbitrations with the seat in Australia since 2010, but it's, you know, not a, not a, it's off a very, very low base. Mm. Um, so we're sort of picking up the crumbs from the Singapore and Hong Kong table, and and now for for companies uh, parties that want to have a uh, formal sort of international court based process, um, you know they'll pick Singapore over Australia. So we, we miss out on that, and so we should be looking at at least trying to keep up in that space. Um, it's a very interesting development because we also see other sort of international commercial courts being established. And, and so far, the reason why um, this hasn't really taken off as an alternative to international arbitration is that the, there hasn't been a, a multilateral convention for enforcement of you know, foreign judgments like we have with the New York Convention for Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Um, and of course, but Singapore and others are sort of pushing to, you know, um, have the Hague uh, Convention on Choice of Court uh, provisions um, uh, ratified, and um, you know that could be a game changer because then, you know, courts become a lot more competitive, if you like, uh, or, or an attract more attractive alternative to international arbitration. And I'm, I'm just conscious of the time, so I might just ask my colleagues if they have any have any questions, Elizabeth. Um, I have one in relation to, I think you mentioned earlier, um, the impact of precedence. Mm. That once, once there is mm. a case, especially at a pedal level, it's mm. very hard to, to move away from that. Mm. How do you see the interaction or, um, I guess, gazing into the crystal ball, the jurisprudence of international arbitration or um, any of these international instruments being dealt with globally? How do you see our future as far as the legal profession and, and applying those? Um, in, in our jurisdictions? Well, I think in relation to precedence, um, the good news is that for something like international arbitration, where really it's based on party consent and it's up to the, it's up to the parties and their legal advisors whether or not they choose this alternative dispute resolution process, um, uh, you know, when judgments come out applying the, the same underlying international instruments like the New York Convention or more recently the model law for you know locally seated international arbitrations and they're sort of out of sync uh, it's you know reported widely very quickly um, law firms put out case notes you know they almost compete to be the first to get out a client newsletter on the latest case um, they those, I must say, tend to be quite generous and sort of not say outright, you know, this is plainly wrong or <laughs> out of sync. Um, but they at least highlight the issues and then, and people like myself, you know, prepared to be a bit more forthright. <laughs> and, so, and certainly when I'm educating the next generation of lawyers, say, look, that this is not why it's out of sync and why we shouldn't follow it. But there are other fields where you know, um, 
it, the, the system can't self-correct in the same to the same degree, you know, like in consumer law field. You know, a, a judge gives a decision on strict product liability, which is out of sync with the underlying EU laws, which have also spread through the Asian region now. Um, you know, uh, but you know, you're not going to get a client newsletter. <laughs> to the same degree uh, or, or discussion about that case as you would with, say, international arbitration. So I think you need to differentiate the areas of law. And in the areas of law where there's less scope for self-correction and, and uh, getting around precedents that go off on a tangent, I think that's where you need to focus mm -hmm. legislative reform attention or other means to try and get the system back on track and get a bit more global convergence. We're discussing um, impediments to more Australian arbitration and you mm -hmm. uh, mentioned a couple of factors. I just wondered whether there were any any others that so, you... Um, normally when people choose to decide where to seek their arbitration, you know, they look at, you know, the legislative framework. Is it based on international instruments? Um, and more than that, does it have the sort of add-ons that you know Singapore and others have been mm. regularly including and uh, updating their legislation with? They look at um, also the, the court's interpretations. Like not only is the court you know neutral and not corrupt and so on, but is it applying these instruments and developing precedents that are in line with the developments overseas? Uh, um, uh, and I think Australia has improved a lot. Um, in both respects, um, but we're still not quite there compared to, you know, the major venues even in our region, let alone more traditional ones in the West. So, so then, then it becomes, then you start looking at factors which are perhaps n not normally so important, but one of, the, one of those is geographical sort of location. Yeah. And, you know, there really is a tyranny of distance and, you know, electronic sort of e-arbitration hasn't taken off. Uh, maybe in, the, it, it, you know, in 10, 20 years, I mean, I was at a conference in London um, celebrating 30 years of their School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary um, University of uh, London. And we had a great presentation by an American lawyer about sort of holograms and uh, this new technology that's sort of evolving and so on, that could make a huge difference. We wouldn't have to assemble here in presence. It would be like Star Wars and the Jedi now, you know, Night Council or something, people beaming in from around the universe. You know, if, if, if we get to that stage, I think, uh, you know, Australia can overcome that <laughs> particular impediment. But, you know, normally those things don't really matter um, so much. But when... But they add to the equation if, on the other more important factors, you know, at best we can just keep up. And, you know, frankly, I think we're not quite keeping up even on those other aspects.